my name is Julian. Uh, I was CEO at the company, so Infinite. And I'm here to talk about key value stores. In particular, I'd like to explain why the existing key value stores may be limited in some ways or for some applications and uh, how we could maybe design uh, a new generation of key value store that could maybe overcome those limitations. So the plan is as follows, we'll uh, study why uh, there are some limitations before introducing Infinite's key value store, which is the one that we've designed and that we are developing. Then I'll introduce the, uh, the API, uh, which uh, I hope you will use at some point. And then uh, we'll do a demo of uh, deploying Infinite's key value store over a Docker Swarm. So key value stores, uh, great construct to store and share uh, data within a, a distributed system. Uh, they have been used increasingly for the past couple of years, in particular to store configuration data, uh, logs, metadata in general. And you probably know key value stores uh, through one of the three that I've put on the slide, uh, which are ETCD, Zookeeper, or Console. So why would we actually need a new one? Uh, I mean, we already have some. Why a new one? Well, the, the reason is very, very simple is that um, the key value stores that exist today have been great for many developers, but for some application, those key value stores just do not meet the requirements uh, of those applications. They are just limited. And the reason for that is that uh, the distribution mechanism, which is based on the manager worker model that you probably know, uh, is again limiting. Uh, so if I just re-explain how that works is that uh, this model has been designed for having uh, workers that can be plugged in so that you can scale out your system very easily. To achieve that, you need managers to orchestrate the system, basically to know which workers are, are, are in the system, where uh, data is located, meaning on which worker, and so on. And this model, again, suited to many applications, but not all of them. It is a limited model, uh, which, and I'll explain why, but I really want you to understand that I'm not uh, saying that it is a bad model. I'm just saying that it is not adapted to all the applications. For instance, Docker Swarm uses it and it's, it's okay. Uh, the, 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 the use cases where uh, this model can be limiting is in particular when the managers are going to be requested a lot. And that's where uh, you may have a problem. So one problem could be scalability because you have those managers that are supposed to help the worker scaled. Uh, those managers cannot be scaled as easily. And that's a problem, obviously, if you need your system to be scalable to extreme conditions. Resilience is another problem because those managers may have uh, to treat a lot of requests, they actually get, they may get overflowed. And if one manager fails, uh, the, 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 the clients may actually redirect their request to the remaining managers, which in turn may actually get overflowed and fail. Or you may have a cascading effect of one manager failing after another one until your system is no longer operational. Security is an obvious one. You have those managers with all the power. If you were an attacker, that's your ideal target. And finally, performance. Because those managers have so many things to do, such as managing the worker nodes, but also handling specific requests from clients, they may not be uh, uh, numerous enough to handle all of those requests in which case it may actually slow down the whole system. So Infinite Key Value Store try to overcome those uh, design flows, if I can say, uh, but how? Uh, the, the, the answer to that question is pretty simple, even though it needs uh, explanation, but it is through a different distribution model. Instead of relying on this manager worker model where the manager, uh, uh, the managers are really key to this model, uh, concentrate a lot of information and power, we use a decentralized architecture, which means that all the nodes in the system are going to collectively work together to achieve the same things. Now, what's important to understand is that in such uh, a model, all the nodes are equally unprivileged. There is no single node that has more power or more information on the system. They are all the same. And this model brings a number of benefits, and I'll go through those. First, regarding scalability. 
in a manager uh, worker model, the, the concentration of requests on the managers, as I explained, may uh, limit the system uh, in, in terms of scalability. But in a decentralized model, all the nodes are going to contribute to processing the requests, meaning that uh, um, you, you, you don't have this uh, problem of uh, uh, the managers need to be scaled manually. Sometimes it requires the administrator to perform a specific task. Sometimes it even requires to interrupt the whole system. In a decentralized model, you don't have this problem and the system scales naturally. And we do that uh, through two algorithms, which is an overlay network, which is not to be confused with Docker's overlay network. The overlay network is an algorithm uh, uh, whose role is actually to route messages to the right node, because keep in mind that in a decentralized architecture, there is no central directory to know uh, which uh, worker has this uh, piece of information. So again, collectively, the nodes need to work together to route the messages to the right nodes. The other layer is a distributed hash table, which is responsible for dealing with redundancy, consistency, fault tolerance, rebalancing, and so on, a lot of stuff. So in this model, and for the scalability aspect, we kind of get rid of the managers and the workers because all the nodes assume both parts. They are all going to uh, do both a little bit of the jobs of the managers and a little bit of the jobs of the workers. So they are all going to participate in maintaining consistency, and they're all going to participate in hosting the blocks. Whereas in the master-slave model, or the manager-worker model, the, 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 the managers deal with the metadata, the access control, and the worker nodes only deal with hosting the actual blocks of data. Resilience and performance also benefit from this model because you have this natural distribution. So you can scale, but also it is going to get to be very fast because the, reque or the requests are not going to be handled, processed by specific manager nodes, but by all the nodes at your disposal. And the phrase, uh, you can imagine that uh, the more nodes you, get, you have in your system, the faster it will actually get because you have more power, more bandwidth to process those requests. But also in terms of resilience, it's good because it's actually far more complicated to overflow the system because you have so many nodes at your disposal to treat your request. So it's, you don't have any bottlenecks, you can't have uh, cascading effects or single points of failure. Security is again an obvious one. Since you don't have this concentration of power in the manager nodes, it's harder for an attacker to gain control or to gain privilege in such a system. But if there are still ways to attack such a decentralized architecture. On one hand, you could actually find a security breach in the network protocols that could help you. The second way to make damage is actually to take over a large portions uh, of the nodes in the system. If you control enough nodes in the system, you may actually influence the decision-making process, and that's gaining a lot of power. And finally, consistency. The way I introduced decentralization was meant to say decentralization was the main differentiator with the other key value store, but the other storage products, and actually most distributed system. Most distributed system use the manager worker model. We don't, but we have another aspect which makes uh, infinite key value store a little bit different. It is the way we uh, achieve and maintain consistency. But first, let us, let's take a, a step, take a step back and explain exactly what consistency is all about. When you have two clients trying to update the same data at the same time, they are going to reach out to all the servers that are hosting the replicas for that uh, value. And the servers do not know which request to accept. Is it uh, the value A or is it the value B? Which value should be the next for uh, the value that is getting stored by those servers? While well, consistency is all about agreeing on one value. It doesn't matter if it's value A or value B. What what's really important is that all the servers agree that it's either one. They need to agree on the same value. That's maintaining consistency. If half the nodes agree it's value A and half the nodes agree it's value B, 
you are in a very big mess. In a manager worker model, what you have is that consensus, which is the, the, the algorithm being run to maintain consistency. Consensus is going to be run within the kernel of manager nodes. So on top of managing the, the, the worker nodes, on top of uh, uh, treating some specific requests from the clients, they also have to run the consensus algorithm every time a client wants to update a value. And this algorithm is very, very expensive. That's something you really have to, to understand. So infinite key value store takes a different approach. Instead of having a single quorum of manager nodes responsible for running the consensus algorithm, infinite key value store has as many quorums as there are values in the system. And that sounds a little bit crazy at first, but it actually brings a, a lot of benefits. As you can see uh, on the screen, quorum one, for instance, would be uh, composed of the three servers hosting the replicas for value, uh, the value associated with key one. Whereas quorum two would be composed of the three nodes hosting the replicas for another value, let's say key two. And as you can, uh, can see, all the quorums are, are disjoint which means that if you were to run parallel updates, so running a consensus algorithm in parallel, what would happen is that it would actually involve completely different groups of nodes. So you wouldn't be uh, uh, impacted in terms of performance by the fact that uh, too many uh, consensus algorithms need to be run by the same nodes. If you come back to the managers, if you had 10 update requests in parallel, the manager nodes would need to run 10 consensus algorithms in parallel. And again, it's a very expensive algorithm. In this case, you have three, con three, three quorums, three dis distinct quorums, so three consensus algorithms that are going to be very fast. But there are two other benefits to this approach. The first one is security. If one node were to be compromised, you can see that it would actually impact only one quorum, so one consensus. So it wouldn't gain as much power in the decision-making process. And the other one is fault tolerance, because again, if one node goes down, it influences, it impacts only one consensus. Now there is another benefit about scalability. And for that, I need you to imagine a network of one million nodes, which is probably not what you do every day, but still. If you were to have one million nodes in a manager worker model, you would have one million uh, workers. To manage those one million more wo workers, you would probably more, need more managers. Let's say 100 managers, which is not that much actually for one million nodes. The problem is that you would need to run the consensus algorithm inside the quorum of managers, which would be composed of 100 nodes, 100 managers. And the complexity of the consensus algorithm is so important that when you add one or two nodes in the consensus algorithm, in the, in the, in the quorum, the number of messages explodes. Which means that if you were to have 100 nodes running a consensus algorithm, the decision-making process would take several seconds, which is obviously not practical for most applications. So in other words, with a manager worker model, if you want to scale it to one million nodes, you need more managers, and that means exactly slowing down your system to impractical use. In a decentralized architecture, however, imagine that we have a redundancy factor of three, meaning that the quorums are composed of three servers, as we saw uh, on the previous slide. That would mean that the consensus algorithm would remain at all times composed of three nodes. So even if you were to have one million nodes, the quorums would still be composed of three nodes, and it would still go fast. In other words, there is a direct link uh, for, manager, for the manager worker mo model, there is a direct link between the number of nodes in the system and the complexity of the consensus. It is not the case for the decentralized architecture. So it means that it's going to go faster, and it scales better. Finally, Raft. I'm sure you've all 
uh, have heard of Raft, which is a consensus algorithm. Raft is great. Uh, it's super easy to use because there are libraries for many, many languages, very easy to pick up, but it is not adapted to all the use cases, very much like the model manager worker. And the reason is that uh, Raft, the way it works, uh, is that there are messages being constantly sent to maintain leadership within the, the quorum of nodes. And that means that it is okay if you have one quorum of five or seven nodes in your system, like it is the case for Docker Swarm, but imagine having one million quorums. Imagine the number of messagings that would be sent when nothing happens. That's just, again, impractical. So what we've decided from day one is for Infinite Key Value Store to use Paxos, which is the algorithm from which Raft derives. And on top of that, we've decided to make Infinite Key Value Store strongly consistent so that the most demanding application can actually use it. So if I were to summarize all the differentiation between uh, Infinite Key Value Store, its approach, and the other uh, distributed system, actually, in general. Well, on one end, you have the decentralization, which means that it is going to actually go faster because you have natural distribution, a lot of nodes to process your request. It is going to be more secure because you don't have one single point to attack. It is going to be more resilient because you cannot overflow your system. And when you couple that with what we call the per block currents, which has just introduced, you have something that even scales to millions of nodes. Now, how can we use that thing? Now, you have to bear with me uh, for the API because it is a little bit different from uh, what you are probably used to with other key value stores. Even though it's not complicated, it is a little bit different. So you have two major differences. The first one is the key. In a normal key value store, you pick a key, you have your value, and you store that uh, tuple in the system, and you want to uh, fetch it back, you use the key. But it is not the case in infinite uh, key value store. You don't get to pick the key. And the reason for that is twofold. First, in practice, it's actually very rare that you need to choose the key. Secondly, uh, infinite need to generate uh, the key that we actually call address. We need to generate the address in a way to optimize data placement and fault tolerance. So that's why we don't let the user pick the key. The second aspect which makes, uh, make, makes it different is the value. In a normal key value store, you just store a value. There is no, that's it. You just store raw data, a string, a number, whatever you want. But in infinite key value store, you have several types of values with, that we call blocks and every block has a trade-off. And that's where it's really, really important to understand because that's where the intelligence of the system really lies. It's in the different types of blocks. So at the, at the core of the system, you have two types of blocks that I will describe, and on top of those blocks, you can create more. The first type of blocks is called mutable block, and as the name suggests, those blocks can evolve over time. You can have multiple versions for the same block. The problem with those blocks is that they are very costly. As we discussed for consistency, you could have two clients updating the same value at the same time, which means that you could have a conflict, which means that you need to run the consensus algorithm to make sure that only one value uh, is picked and the servers agree on the value. And that is very expensive, as we discussed. The other aspect is that though the, your cache, if you were to keep such a block in your cache, you cannot be sure that you have the latest version at any time. So you actually need to invalidate your cache from time to time to refresh it by fetching the latest value from the key value store. And all of those aspects make such blocks very expensive. Now what you need to understand is that in classical, classic common key value store, uh, that's the type of value that you actually manipulate. When you have a value and you store it, you can update it, which means it is a mutable value and you have to pay the price, which is all of the things that I've just described. So infinite key value store introduces a new type of block, which is called immutable block. And as the name suggests, these types of blocks can only exist in one version. And that sounds counterintuitive, but in practice, again, it brings a number of benefits. 
Since there can only be one version, it means that you cannot update it, you cannot have conflict, you do not need to run the consensus algorithm, so it's super fast and super uh, uh, cheap to actually store such a block. The other benefit is that you can actually keep such blocks in cache forever without worrying of being updated because it's not possible. And finally, a nice thing is that you do not necess necessarily need to fetch the value from the key value store, meaning from the current responsible for hosting the replicas, which is the case for a mutable block because they are the source of truth. They know which one is the latest value. But for an immutable block, there is no different versions. So you could actually ask a neighbor node, another client, get the block, validate its integrity, which is very easy because we rely on content hashing, and that's it, you know, it's a valid block, it's the only one, you can use it. So now that you understand the different types of blocks, the API, which is composed of two families of functions. On one end, you can generate uh, blocks, and then you can manipulate the key value store. So you can do make immutable block or make mutable block, and as you can see, those calls return to you both an address, which is the key, which has been generated for you, and the block itself with your data. Once you have a block, you can insert it with the second family of functions, or you can update the block if it is mutable, remove it, and fetch it. So pretty straightforward. All the intelligence really lies in the different types of blocks. So that's it for me. I would like you to welcome Quentin, who was a CTO at Infinite, uh, as you know, uh, and uh, he'll do a demo of, uh, of Infinite. Hi. Hi, so I'm Quentin. So let's see this at work. Uh, so I have here a uh, swarm that I configured before. Oops, wait a second. So I have a swarm. It's composed of, um, what do you do? That's a strange, what? Oh, okay, no, wait. Just give me a second. Okay, whatever. Uh, so <laughs> I did not understand what happened there. Uh, so I have a Docker Swarm with 10 nodes that I configured before. So let's deploy the infinite key value store in there. I have a small script for that. Here, so um, we're going to create a service with, say, 16 replicas. I'm going to have a few secrets with a u infinite user and infinite network that I configured before. A network is what we call the key value store. It's part of an uh, infinite overlay network. I'm going to publish a port to listen to gRPC requests with the API Julian described. And the actual script uh, will just load the user, load the network, create some local storage. So all of my 16 nodes are going to store blocks locally. And finally, I just infinite docker run. I listen for gRPCs on port 9000. I listen uh, on the, for the infinite protocol internally on port 9001. And here I'm just giving the tasks that infinite, passing the task that infinite special address, which is the uh, swarm DNS discovery address. So all nodes are going to connect to each other and form a mesh networks of 16 nodes. So let's do this. Okay, so I have my, uh, Swarm service with 16 nodes, or soon to be. Um, so let's take a look. Let's use the API. So I'm going to do that in Python. What we're going to do is we're going to build a very simple app on top of the KB store. We're going to store a list of images. Uh, how are we going to design that using the API is that we're going to store the actual images inside immutable blocks because they're going to be extremely fast and we don't need to update the images. And we're just going to have one immutable block that will uh, hold the list of addresses to the actual images. That's a very common pattern with mutable and immutable blocks. So I have a simple connect function that takes an endpoint and simply initializes the uh, gRPC connection. The init function uh, will create my index, my multiple block. So as you see, 
we just call make mutable block to create that block. Inside, uh, we for the payload, we just put uh, an empty Python list that we pickle, so it's binary. We insert that in the KB store and we return the address of the block we just created in hexadecimal. And I also define an index function that I can use to fetch the index back given its address. Let's try that already. So here I have a, uh, a small container that I can drop in and that has a Python interpreter with that uh, those function preloaded. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the uh, connect function we just saw. So I'm going to connect. It's inside the open network, so I'm just going to connect to the gRPC endpoint of the service. And now I can use the init function I just show you guys. And it's, so this created the mutable block, pushed it, and gave me the address back. I'm going to copy for later. And uh, we can check it work because I can uh, call the index function we saw earlier to fetch the block back. So this is uh, the block stored inside the DHT. It can be a bit scary because uh, Infinite does a lot of cryptography. But what's important is the data plane field here, which is the empty list pickled. OK, so we created uh, the index mutable block, and we got its address. Let's now see how we're going to uh, add data inside our system. So let's create uh, an add function. So I'm going to take the KV store, the address of the index block, and some content to store in there. So first, I retrieve the index block uh, using the index function. I'm going to make an immutable block using the content I was passed as the payload. Then I'm going to uh, load and pickle the, in the, the data from the index, append the address of the block I just created, put that back inside the index, update the index in the KV store, and once this is done, I'm going to push also the immutable block that has the image content. So that would work. We are pushing an image inside uh, the key value store, except, as you may have uh, anticipated, that does not handle conflicts, because I fetch the index, I add an address at the end, and then I update the index. What happens if two uh, nodes do that at the same time, try to add some content to the list at the same time? So there's going to be a conflict, so we need to handle that. So let, let's upgrade the add function. So um, I'm going to assume that content is a Python dictionary, so I can add a field in there for the demo. I'm going to count the number of conflicts there has been when uh, inserting every object. So I just initialize initializes it to zero at the very beginning. Then while true, I'm going to keep retrying, updating the index while there is a conflict until I, I finally succeed. And uh, if you look at the uh, uh, cut block in red, you see that after the update, I'm going to check whether it succeeded. So if it succeeded, it's good. We can just leave. And if there was a conflict, I'm going to increment the counter I put in the, uh, in the, um, in the dictionary. And the conflict message will give you back the block, the values that would, was picked instead of the one we wanted. So this is the new index. And it probably has another address inside that because someone else added an image. So I, all I need to do is keep looping and try, retry adding my address in there and pushing it. At some point, I will finally uh, manage to update it. Uh, you also see I have added a sleep in there because uh, this goes extremely fast. So uh, it's, this, is, this is almost never going to trigger a conflict in, on small payloads. So I've had, added a sleep there to try to trigger more, more conflicts for the demo because I'm going to wait between the time I fetch the index and I push it. So it's just to artificially trigger conflicts for the demo. Um, and now that we have this add function, let's build a very simple uh, toy app. We're going to fetch some uh, kitten images from an uh, imager and push them inside the, um, inside, uh, the Key Valley store. So I'm going to use a simple writer service. All it does is connect to the endpoint, and while true, I'm going to fetch uh, an image from an uh, imager and uh, I'm going to use the add function to push a um, Python dictionary in there that has the content of the image and also the host name of the container. So we're going to be able to see what container pushed the object inside the KV store. And we do so every second or so, thanks to the sleep. And we're going to have a reader uh, service 
that that is a simple WSGI uh, server that will just show us the images. So how it works is we just uh, retrieve the index, we display the number of images, and then we're going to uh, sh um, show the latest 32 images directly inside the HTML code as base64. So it's one single page. So let's try running zoos. I'm going to go back here. Um, so first, we're going to start the reader service. So I'm going to start uh, one container and detach it. I'm going to listen on port 8000. Um, I'll go to the end, okay. Uh, we're going to connect to uh, the infinite service on port 9000. And here I'm going to pass the root address we just copied earlier so we can find the, uh, the root index. And if the demo guard is okay with me today. Okay, so uh, we have the simple reader that just retrieves the index. And so for now, there are, of course, no image in there. Let's, whoops. I made a mistake. I lost the IP of that machine. <laughs> bear, with, bear with me for a second. What is the IP? That. Eight thousand. Okay, back on track. So I have the reader running. Let's start uh, the writer. So this one, we're going to start it as a um, as a swarm service. So I'm going to create a service with one replica, pass it my imager uh, API key. In the overlay network, same, we're going to connect to the infinite service on port 9000. And again, I am going to, so I did copy the IP instead, so I need now to find. So the root address was this. Copy it again. And here we go. Sorry about that. So and I'm going to start the, um, the writer with one replica on the root address that we saved earlier. It's running, and let's see how it works. Here we go. So uh, we have a worker that every second will push an eBay, a random image from Imager inside our key value store, and the reader does pick it. So uh, of course, if you look at it, um, there are, it's always the same host pushing because there's only one container pushing, and there are never any conflicts because we have only one writer, okay? So let's, uh, let's see, still see. Already 40 images of kittens, so it's still working. So it's a fun. Let's let's try to uh, ramp that up. So I'm going to um, scale the writer service to say three writers. Good to go. And now it should fill up quicker. And so already 89 uh, images. And if you look. You will see that there are now different containers pushing, uh, pushing images. And you see there that some of them encountered conflicts, thanks to the sleep I put in the code. So some of those uh, containers had to retry pushing the index uh, because another of the three workers pushed the index while they were trying to update it. Good. So what do we have here? Well, we have um, an application that stores just imager, uh, image kitten images and uh, is able to list them, but you have to realize that it does that in a decentralized fashion on 16 nodes, meaning that it's entirely distributed, there are no masters, no nothing. And as Julian said, uh, Infinity is designed to be flexible, so let's flex it, for instance. Say uh, I have not enough room for my kittens, uh, I can just go in there and say that I want more room for kittens, and I'm going to scale the Infinite uh, service to 32. Was there? It's going to finish, and if I do that and I refresh, it keeps working exactly the same. So with a simple command, I just doubled my uh, my storage space and my throughput. <clears throat> and uh, Infinite is also designed to be. Uh, let's first check it actually distributes. For instance, on my master, if I look to all the containers running, so 
you see that this one has been is one of the new one. It's been running for. Oops. How does the Mac work? Okay, uh, it's been running for 24 seconds, so it's one of the new one. And if I go in there. Um, if I look here, you can see that this is one of the new containers and it's indeed receiving blocks. So we are actually distributing the, uh, the images on the, new, uh, on the new node. And since it is resilient, what I can do is I can also kill, for instance, one of this container. I'm not even stopping it, I'm killing it abruptly. And if I kill it, because there is, there is replication in there, the app is still going to be I don't really care. Uh, this, the app is, thank you. The, uh, the app is going to be still running exactly the same because those blocks were re replicated in the system. And even better, uh, that node died, but the other node just detected that this node died and re, re replicated those blocks that were on that node to other nodes. So we just, we just have resilience. You, could, you can scale in, scale out, you can handle fault, you can just restart a container, move it around, and we have a completely distributed storage system that just uh, is extremely flexible and handle faults. That's it for the demo. So to conclude, uh, well, thanks for listening. I hope uh, we made it clear uh, how we decided to design Infinite Key Value Store and the benefits uh, there are and how to use it. Uh, now, just so you know, we intend to open source it for in the next one or two months. Um, so if you fancy contributing, obviously you are welcome. In the meantime, uh, if you want to take a look at it or use it as an alpha tester, uh, you can send us an email <coughs> or just come talk to us uh, and we'll, uh, we'll try to do that. If you want to know more, there is one website for the infinite storage platform, which is the storage platform which is built on top of this key value store. So you'll find more information there. Uh, and that's basically it. We have five minutes for questions, so shoot. Hello. Okay, um, if I could just ask you to line up in the aisles just so I can hand you the microphone <coughs> so people online can hear the questions and answers. And, sorry, sorry, I'm not gonna run around. So just pass, pass back over there. Um, so the storage platform you're talking about, uh, does it have some other database then to keep track of the key keys that are being generated by Infinite? So no, so the, um, so the storage platform is still, it's, it's something on top of it, but something else that's provides to, to provide uh, volumes or block devices or object storage. So that's something else. For the key value store itself, the addresses, the keys are uh, collectively stored and, and, and indexed. Uh, so there is no database to keep the, the, the index if that's the, the keys, if that's your question. So let's say I'm storing stuff in there. I have to keep track of all those addresses, do I not? If you're well, storing stuff in the key value store? No, the, 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 I mean, ah, yeah, I see your point. Yeah, uh, you have to maintain, um, you have to keep the address, yes, to reference your future values, but the reason um, we don't let you pick the key is because in practice, um, you tend to have an hierarchy of blocks in your system. So you need a, a, a string, so a key that you have chosen just to reference, to bootstrap the system to reference the first block from which you will find the other one. And for that. Yeah, the, the way I would put it is um, this key, it's still a key value store, but it's a bit lower level than ATCD and Zookeeper. For instance, you know, initially we do a, a file system, and the file system is built on top of that. As you can imagine, you can design a hierarchy in, uh, inside that. And so the idea is that it's a bit low level and you build on top of it. And you could build actually an ATCD or Zookeeper uh, interface on top of it, and we intend to do so at some point. But, so True, it's lower level, so you, des you yourself design the structures of your block, your hierarchy inside the blocks. So okay, you, you, there will be a layer to pick a key. Uh, you will have that, but it's, uh, it's really a layer on top of this. This is the most important aspect. Uh, the resolution between a string, a key, and an address will be provided, but uh, we advise people to understand that this is not a normal way to access your data every time. It's really a bootstrap, uh, bootstrap way to find the first block, 
then you keep that address in cache and you reference that root block uh, with the address directly. So the resolution between the key and the address should be done only once. That's our approach. Okay, thanks. So I guess the first question is sort of following on in terms of like sometimes we use KV locks are used for distributed lock uh, mechanisms and in that case the key must be known in advance. Um, so does this mechanism address that use case? That's yeah. the first question. Yeah, that would be the same. Right. Okay, the second one I had was when we were looking at the, uh, so, so there's an upper bound, I guess I could express it, the number of um, quorums, available quorums in the entire cluster um, has to be equal to the number of keys that the cluster can um, support. So do, do the quorums have to be completely disjointed? Uh, can they, is there a reason they can't even share one node? That's, and um, what's the, you know, what's the upper bound in terms of like the available, you have to calculate the number of available nodes in the uh, quorums in the cluster to know how many keys you can support. It's, <clears throat> it's more, it's the other way around. Every <laughs> time you create a block, you pick a number of nodes to be responsible for that block and they form a quorum all together. So yes, there is one quorum for every block. Um, now, even if uh, two set of nodes, like three nodes, happens to be in the similar quorum twice for two different blocks, there's no need to uh, bring, to make only one quorum. I mean, the quorum, it's packed, so, so it has no cost. So you can see it as the same quorum if you want, or two different quorum, but it's really, uh, every node just happen to, f nodes form a quorum when they have to handle a block all together. So, so it's not necessary to disjoint the quorums? No, okay. no, that was an example, but no. In practice, it really depends on how many nodes you have and how many values you have. If you have a lot more values than node, it won't be disjoint. Okay, thanks. All right, sorry to interrupt. Um, we'll take one more question over the microphone and then if you guys yeah, don't mind, we can step idea. aside and just to have the next session uh, set up. So here you go. So one, one last question then. Uh, Swarm itself has its scalability issues with the RAF protocol. Any ability of this in the future to potentially replace that and give us a more scalable Swarm? Uh, that's, 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 um, that's still not defined. Uh, I mean, we'd like to address many of those aspects because that's really our specialty, uh, if I can say. Uh, but there is always a trade-off between, okay, we've done that, it's good enough, let's move on, and, and come back and trying to always improve on, on, on past things. I think it's, if it's really going to be an issue, it's possible that uh, infinite uh, technology is going to be used to replace. But we still don't know. Thanks. So if you love the presentation, uh, vote for us. And if you do, did not like it, well, if you vote for us, we're going to have to wake up on Thursday and do the presentation again. So still vote for us. Right. Okay, thank you.